Hello everyone, this is Rio Cloud Sync. Um, today we're going to be going through the use case scenarios of per user MFA. So that's per user multi-factor authentication. Um, if you're not using the likes of security defaults and conditional access, um, then per user MFA may be the, the option for your business or, or organization. Um, there are some pitfalls for using per user MFA and there also are some advantages such as granularity. Um, so what I'll do, I'll take you through um, where you can access the per user MFA um, pane as well as the settings in terms of configuring per user MFA for name locations um, as well as the authentication methods. Um, so you can access per user MFA through the Azure Active Directory as the identity management solution or you can access it through the, um, the Microsoft 365 Admin Center. Um, my, my preference is accessing it through um, a short active directory. It's just a bit more seamless, but gets you to the same place. Um, so once you've accessed portal.azure.com, you then navigate to Azure Active Directory by searching the search pane here, or using your widgets in your homepage. If you click the widget Azure Active Directory, it will take you to the identity management um, pane. Um, in which obviously you can manage your organization through users, groups, external identities, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, with per user, per user MFA, it, it is uh, a free tier level of uh, multi-factor authentication um, if you are using particular authentication methods. Um, if you're using some, uh, some more of the advanced authentication methods, such as um, the Authenticator app, um, as well as FIDO tokens, such as um, hardware tokens. Um, you may have came across RSA as, as a, um, a hardware token or a VPN token. Um, they do require the use of P1 or P2 um, licensing. Uh, but if we go into users, uh, this will bring up your user pane with all your listed users, uh, of which you can enable per user for. Um, you just need to make sure that you're not utilizing conditional access or security defaults in the interim. Um, if you do enforce per user on top of a user who is using the likes of conditional access, there may be a conflict of interest in terms of what authentication method to use um, and, and, and when they're enforced. Um, so best practice is to use uh, you know, only one of the um, authentication um, policies. Um, so once you're in here, you can then select per user MFA. Um, the name of convention is quite um, quite indicative of, of what this does um, in terms of granularity. This is one of the advantages. You can select um, who you would like to enforce into um, MFA. Um, so that's that two-factor level of authentication. So upon signing, the user will be um, requested to authenticate into um, MFA. Okay. Um, this tenancy in question, we're not actually using anything at the moment. I've literally just opted out of security defaults, uh, which is obviously another free tier of, of, of multi-factor authentication, uh, which you get a 14 day grace period for. When you're using the likes of per user MFA, um, it's enforced um, as and when you press the, the enable button um, for the user. Um, so for example, if we've got user A here, if I do select them, I do have two options here to enable or manage user settings. If we press enable, it will give you a, a brief policy tip about enabling multi-factor multi authentication, um, a link to the relevant Microsoft documentation, um, as well as uh, the URL um, of which users can set up their authentication methods, uh, but they'll be able to do that anyway upon initial signing. So if you press enable MFA, it will set date successfully. Um, user A is now enabled for MFA. So upon next sign in, when I go into either portal.azure or portal.office.com, I type in user A at rio.cloudsync.microsoft.com and their associated password. Um, the user will then um, set up their initial first time authentication methods. Um, as an admin, from an admin perspective, if I log into this pane again after user A has signed in for the first time, um, that will then transition from enabled to enforced. Okay, that's just from a, a reporting perspective. You can filter as and as and how you would like. So if you want to see all the enabled users, so who haven't signed in as of yet, and the enforced users, as well as um, if you want to filter it down from directory um, role, uh, global admin, bin admins, etc. Best practice is to have all global admins enforced as well as any other directory roles. So in terms of um, per user MFA, that's it in terms of enforcement. Um, you do have the service setting pane. 
in which you can configure the likes back passwords. Um, so say for example, you do have a um, some sort of legacy um, app, uh, a use of a, uh, a printer, for example, who they can't physically approve an authentication request. Um, you can create an app password of which you obviously download that app password. You put it into the either the hardware device or the application of which you have enforced MFA, um, and then the app password will do the job in terms of authenticating through the um, unique string. Um, you do have trusted IPs as well, um, in which um, you can set up like name locations, for example. So say, for example, you have an office, um, you have 30 to 40 users in the office and you don't want them to be in for, uh, you don't want them to have to authenticate when they are in said uh, location. Um, you can place your IPv4 address in the box below, um, or, of which when they do sign in within this um, range of IP or CIDR notation, um, they won't be off. They won't have to authenticate to MFA, but anything outside of that location, they will have to um, re-authenticate. Okay. Um, you've also got the list of verification options here in terms of what you can label and what you can't. Um, as I said, um, this like this um, tenancy does have an E5 license. However, if you do, uh, if you are using some sort of free tier um, SKU or no SKU at all, some of these um, options may be greyed out um, due to licensing prerequisites. Um, as I said, the authentication app is uh, one of the authentication methods you need a premium license for, as well as it is the most preferred method from a Microsoft standpoint. Okay. Um, and then you've got um, remembering device. Um, so remembering trusted device. So um, there is a, um, a rotation of um, keys um, as, as well as um, token um, for um, Azure AD accounts. Um, so that token will refresh as per Microsoft's uh, base guideline. Um, however, you can change that in terms of um, zero to 365 days. Um, so for example, if I set this to 90, I authenticate once, I don't have to authenticate for another 90 days, for example, okay? Um, with, with other authentication um, policies such as conditional access, you, you do have a bit more granularity in terms of session persistence, um, uh, token refresh, um, so per user is really just for those entry level SMB um, businesses or, or just uh, you know you have 5 to 10 users and you only want a few of them um, enforced with multi-factor authentication. Um, the only thing I've, uh, else I've got to make you aware of is per user MFA will be uh, deprecated um, coming 2024, um, of which this is noted in Azure AD. If you go to Azure AD, you go down to security and you go down to authentication methods. You will see here um, that on September 30th, 2024, legacy MFA and self surface password reset will be combined. Um, of which um, all of it will be configured within this single pane of glass. Um, it will give you a bit more granularity in terms of scoping out um, users into groups, targeting um, MFA deployments um, through, through the management of security groups, as well as the use of other third party based um, authentication tokens, etc. Okay, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Um, I will bring in, uh, bring in out some more videos in terms of the use case scenarios of, of MFA as well as other preferred security um, deployments. Thank you very much.